Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today is May 16th, and we welcome you to another edition of the Recon Lecture Series brought to you by University Hospitals at Case Western Reserve University in collaboration with SUNY Upstate and Syracuse, and supported by the Society of Genital Urinary Reconstructive Surgeons. Um, this is a webinar style presentation, so you can submit your questions through the Q&A function located at the bottom ribbon on your screen, and we'll address those questions at the end. Uh, today, we have Dr. Andrew Peterson as a guest speaker. He will talk to us about urosymphysial fistula with resultant uh, pubic bone osteomyelitis. Dr. Peterson is a, uh, is a reconstructive urologist and a professor of surgery at Duke University. He has an extremely busy uh, reconstructive urology practice uh, with the added dimension of complex intra-abdominal reconstruction in cancer survivors. Um, he runs one of the premier recon fellowships in the country um, and has a track record of graduating really cool fellows, not biased at all. Um, he's a scholar, a mentor, uh, a guide, and a friend, and we are delighted to have him here today. Drew, take it away. Thanks, Shubham. Um, and just nod and make sure that I can uh, be heard okay. So I appreciate the invitation to, uh, to talk to everybody today. And uh, you know, these types of lectures are really going to become the mainstay and the norm. So I think your facility is really at the forefront of pushing this and providing a great service to everybody. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure to be able to talk to something that uh, talk to you about something that I've really become very, very interested in and uh, has become a big mainstay of our practice. And that's the pubic bone osteomyelitis that results in cancer survivors after radiation therapy. Um, and after developing a, a subsequent pubic bone fistula uh, to the pubic symphysis. Um, about 10 years ago, when I joined the faculty at Duke, we started seeing cancer survivors that were about eight to 10 years out from their radiation therapy. And we recognized this strange syndrome of these long-term survivors where they were coming into clinic with a long history of chronic pelvic pain and chronic prostatitis treated multiple times at other places with long-term antibiotics. Their symptoms would wax and wane. They'd be diagnosed with recurrent UTIs. Some of them would get it, infections of the skin that would resolve. And many of them had been referred to us because of prior erosions or infections of devices such as penile prosthesis and artificial sphincters. And some of them even had developed this pain with walking. We really didn't know what was the etiology of uh, this in a lot of these patients. Uh, the kind of index patient that Dr. Gupta knows very well because he helped me take care of this man. He's 78 years old. He had Gleason 6 many years ago. He was treated with brachytherapy seven years ago. He developed a stricture. Many of us are familiar with this. So he got a TUR. Then he had pain and a recurrence of stricture. So guess what? He got another TUR. And then he developed problems walking. And those uh, also were accompanied by recurrent UTIs and this chronic debilitating pain syndrome. And we just couldn't figure out what was wrong with the and going on. And he was actually referred to us for incontinence and other issues with the bladder. But um, we were dealing with these as well. Through pure serendipity, this uh, patient's primary care doctor actually was working up his inability walking and thought that it was related to his lumbar spine. And they actually got an MRI of the spine. And we were lucky enough that for some reason they protocoled it and it went low enough in order to catch this area of the pubic symphysis and actually in the report, the radiologist commented on that. So for pure serendipity, this actually demonstrated some bone infection and that's what led to us starting to figure this uh, scenario out, uh, that possibly this was the resultant problem. Well, since then over the last uh, basically 10 years, 2011 to 2019, we have 48 men that we're following who have enough follow-up for me to mention to you. We're actually in the 50s right now of patients who have come to our facility and received some sort of treatment for this problem. The real common theme is that every patient had exposure to some form of radiation therapy, external beam, a radical prostatectomy followed by adjuvant external beam, combined therapy, brachy with external beam, external beam followed by salvage cryo, and then we have one patient in the group who had HIFU. So very uncommon and not have a prior history of exposure to radiation therapy. That's the primary etiology here. The interesting thing also is that what led to their pain syndromes in almost all the cases, 46 out of 48 in this cohort, was some sort of development of a problem after radiation therapy, such as stricture, and an outlet procedure. So the combination of radiation therapy many years ago, seven to 10 years ago, and then development of a problem that needed endoscopy then resulted in these pain syndromes. 
almost everybody presents with this chronic pelvic pain, 96% of these guys. Over half of them had some sort of history of a groin abscess or a thigh abscess. And then a lot of them had these diagnosis of recurrent UTIs. And many had had ICU admissions as well for sepsis that resolve with aggressive antibiotic therapy and then even cellulitis. This is a classic picture of where you might get this. Sometimes they get erythema and cellulitis in the prepubic region as well. But you can see that anytime you get cellulitis or anything in the thigh, in a patient with a history of prior radiation therapy and then pain with walking, and then they develop this problem, what that, what's going on is the bone is usually infected and it tracks down into that inguinal region. So many of them had presented this way. And the average time in our cohort, median was seven years, average was eight years uh, from the time of the radiation therapy. So I think that took us a while to figure that out was the idea that the radiation was so darn long ago, but now they're developing symptoms. And I think we've clearly determined that radiation, like we say, is that gift that keeps giving. And now that these guys are living much longer because the cancer teams are getting so good at keeping people alive, we're seeing these men now 10, 20, 30 years out from the radiation therapy. And of course, we're going to be seeing issues and side effects that we never uh, saw before. So it's really what's called a survivor bias, the idea that we're getting so good at treating these that now we're developing different problems down the road because the cancer's treated. Uh, to really diagnose this, you can do cystoscopy. And every now and then, you'll get fortunate enough to be able to see the fistula. This is the opening of the bladder. This is really that anterior pubic bone region uh, where the prostate used to be. And that's your fistula right there uh, that you can see going into that pubic symphysis. I've got a couple of videos. This is a patient that we saw just a little while ago. You can see us go through the membranous urethra here. The bladder's in here. You can see that now we're looking anteriorly. And most often you'll just see the shaggy white stuff and some stone formation. Well, that stone is actually exposed bone and every now and then you can go into it. The most drastic video I've got is this one. This is actually exposed pubic bone right here, and we can actually drive our cystoscope right into the pubic symphysis. You can see that's bladder right there. So let me play that again for you. This is quite striking, uh, but every now and then we get one of these types of cystoscopy evaluations. The most common thing though that you'll see on cystoscopy is shaggy area anteriorly there and some uh, calcification type stuff where that bone is, is gonna be exposed to urine. So the idea is once you develop that fistula, that urine exposes that joint to uh, corrosive infected uh, material, and then the bone starts spreading out laterally. The real key to diagnosing this though is imaging. And what we've realized is that MRI is gonna be the most sensitive way to image this. We looked at our group uh, and their MRI findings and we found that every patient in our cohort on MRI had increased T2 weighted sequences in that area. I'm gonna show you some pictures of that in a second. 70%, two thirds of them actually had concomitant involvement of the tendons where all those muscles insert right on that pubic bone such as the adductors and the obturator muscles. And that explains some of the pain that they get and the pain with walking. Basically they develop a wicked uh, tendonitis there. And then every now and then you'll see delayed stuff such as diastasis of the pubic symphysis as the bone gets eaten away but almost everybody also has fluid collection in there. We looked at our cohort and um, published this with the radiologist just uh, last year uh, to explain this. So that is out there as well now, so that hopefully the word will continue to get out on how to diagnose this. And the reason we thought that was important to publish that in the radiology literature is very frequently I will get an MRI report on a patient that does not mention the osteo or the fistula. And when we look at the films ourselves, it's quite obvious that it's there. So it's not something that many radiologists are trained to look for or even on the tip of their mind, but hopefully this will continue to be a much more uh, look for system. So again, I told you that the best way to diagnose is an MRI. Well, sometimes you'll see it on a plain film. This is a delayed uh, patient who had a prolonged course of pain. And you can see that the pubic symphysis has some diastasis and you can see some moth eaten area of that area, but that's a much delayed uh, thing on plain film. This is the classic thing you're going to see on MRI. Here you can see T2 fat sat axial image through the base of the bladder. Here is the base of the bladder with uh, fluid in it. Here's your fistula going right into your pubic symphysis. And here's your pubic bone right here and right here. And that's quite obvious. And believe it or not, many radiologists will read this as they'll think that's fat in there or something like that and not make the connection that that's actually a fistula. It's getting better. The reports are getting better but that's why I insist on seeing these images ourselves. It's probably the only MRI I can actually interpret. I'll be very honest about that. 
Um, and so I go straight to fat sat axial T2 weighted images. And this is, uh, it lights up. It's almost like we should term it kind of like the um, pheochromocytoma. It's like the light bulb sign almost. I have to call it the peterson Shubham sign, I think, or something. So uh, sometimes you'll see subtle issues like this. This is another T2 weighted image, but you can see fluid and even some uh, fat or necrotic material in that pubic symphysis. Um, the APs don't work as well, but here you can see that's definite osteomyelitis or infected bone on that, um, that type of film. Now, occasionally a patient cannot get an MRI. So actually we had a very high suspicion in a couple patients, so we actually did cystograms. These are some interesting studies. Um, this is actually a patient who had an artificial sphincter in place and we turned his artificial sphincter on and he developed pain and we had a high suspicion of this. He could not get an MRI because he had a pacemaker that was not uh, compatible. And so we did a cystogram and here you can see we filled the bladder up with uh, contrast. We got our obliques and you might see a little bit of a hint of a fistula right here, but then on the emptying phase, look, we filled up his pubic symphysis and it stays in that pubic symphysis with contrast. Um, that helped us lead to the report of where we unmasked several episodes of pubic symphysis osteomyelitis with results in osteomyelitis after we placed artificial sphincters in men. And the idea was that we thought that um, these were infected AUS as we took them out and the guys got kind of better. What was really going on was they were so incontinent that they were draining all their urine out and they were never backing it up into that symphysis and they never got sick. We turned their AUS on and in three cases, Within two weeks, they developed this syndrome of pain with walking, anterior pubic symphysis pain, and those types of things. So we're very careful about this right now. So that can happen. And I have a feeling that a lot of infected uh, devices, infected prosthetics, are probably actually pubic symphysis infection. And the idea is you take them out, and for some reason, they get slightly better. But these are the patients who never really bounce back 100%. So again, the MRI is the key. Uh, sometimes you'll get lucky and pick it up on a CT scan. This was a CT scan for a patient who was admitted with what the team thought was a uh, Fournier's gangrene. Uh, you know, he had that uh, erythema that I showed you on the picture before. They got the CT scan, and here you can see air in that prepubic symphysis space, and it comes right through the joint and comes out onto your anterior, anterior abdominal wall. See that? So that's actually a fistula that's originating in the bladder that's coming through the pubic symphysis and now you're infecting that area. What that looks like on MRI, again, if we scroll through this MRI, this is T2 axial fat sat images. Here's the base of your bladder and here's your pubic symphysis. If I scroll through that, you see that fistula go right through that pubic symphysis and look, now we have T2 high um, intensity signal out here. That's all urine on the anterior pubic uh, wall. So that's why they get that anterior pubic problem and watch this, it even will sometimes go down into that kind of femoral triangle and that's why they get abscesses on that anterior thigh because that's where it tracks down. So MRI is really the key to diagnosing this. I'll run through this again. So if you scroll through this, you can see it's starting at the base of the bladder right here, like a dumbbell coming anterior right through the pubic symphysis and out to the anterior abdominal wall. Um, our sensitivity actually is almost 100%. When a man has, a prior history of radiation to the bladder or to the uh, uh, prostate, they develop pain and recurrent infections. And if they have pain when you push on their pubic bone, the pretest probability of this MRI being positive is 100%. And they have those three things. When they have a history of radiation, pain with walking, and then super pubic pain on physical exam, our pretest probability right now is 100% on MRI to find this. Okay, so what's the treatment? Well, originally, we thought we'd be able to cure this with conservative management. Dr. Gupta helped us write this article and this uh, algorithm. So we put together a multidisciplinary team, and that team uh, consisted of orthopedic surgery. And at Duke, we actually have an orthopedic infectious disease clinic, believe it or not. They mainly focus on trauma and those types of things, but Ted Hendershot is the ID doctor who runs that clinic. He's been instrumental in helping us design our pathways. Uh, we involve hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We uh, have a very active uh, service here, nutrition, and then we end up moving forward if needed with pubic symphysectomy and resection of the bone. Now, originally when we developed this, we, we developed this, this pathway. This is, uh, Shubham actually built this for us, and we published this uh, many years ago. 
But the idea was that at first we thought we'd be able to help these guys out with high dose antibiotics, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and maybe cure this problem without the need for uh, extirpative surgery. And we were extrapolating data from long bone osteomyelitis data from trauma, meaning femurs and that kind of stuff where they were able to cure it that way. What we found was when we wrote this article and we circulated among the team, we wanted to say, here's our algorithm, here's how great it works. It was very interesting. Ted Hendershot, the infectious disease doctor, called me up and said, we've got to rewrite this article completely. And I said, oh God, he wants to put more medicine stuff in there. He said, no, what this data says is this is a surgical disease. This is not a medical disease and we cannot cure this with our pathway. We, Because everybody ended up going towards uh, surgery. And so we wrote it, rewrote it as such. And that's actually what we validated over the last 10 years of my experience with this disease process. It is extremely uncommon to be able to treat this and cure it without extirpative surgery. The other thing I've learned is that the extirpative surgery requires a cystectomy, period. End of story. You cannot salvage the bladder in these patients, and that's what our experience tells us of, of uh, over 50 men right now. So, surgery is the key. I think this is actually Dr. Gupta in one of our earlier cases. Um, and again, extirpative surgery is the key, and the key is to remove the infected bone. And the problem is when you remove the infected bone, that radiated infected bladder tends to come with it. Anybody who's done a salvage cystectomy or salvage prostatectomy knows exactly what I'm talking about. But these surgeries uh, go very, very well. Um, these are some pictures of the extirpative component. I do actually the bone removal myself. We do have the orthopedic surgeon there uh, you know, for moral support, but really what goes on is all you have to do is take enough bone out until it starts bleeding normally and understand the anatomy down there. And nobody understands that anatomy better than a urologist who does extirpative surgery, quite honestly. So we tend to take the bone out ourselves. Um, this is a picture. Here's one where at the right of the picture, that's the bladder. We filled it up with fluid. This is the pubic bone. We've rolled the fascia off the pubic bone and left it connected in the midline. And this is us using an osteotome in order to uh, chip that uh, fistula out of there and remove the bone. And what you find is when you remove that bone, there's usually a necrotic, um, there's usually a necrotic component of the uh, old prostate that's in there, and you just scoop that out as well. So here's one where we now have removed the bladder, we've removed all the bone, and here's that bed where that prostate used to sit. And then we just recently got a nice picture of an actual fistula uh, where it was at, and I don't know how well this pro this uh, projects, but up here is the bladder. The penis is down here to your left, and you can actually, we've got a probe actually in the fistula where it goes all the way through that pubic symphysis joint and where it has come out and gone down onto the thigh. So um, you can see these fistula. This is that picture that I showed a little while ago, that patient who had a very long history of recurrent infections uh, and uh, recurrent hospitalizations. This is his diastasis here. When we ended up actually taking the bone out, this is what it looks like. So you can see we've taken the majority of the inferior pubic rami and the superior pubic rami and removed all that infected bone. And what you have to do to really get a good outcome, we've learned, is that you have to be pretty aggressive at taking the bone out. You, you don't want to stop until you see totally normal bone. And really, it's quite obvious. You'll take necrotic bone out. It'll have pus in it. And then when you start doing the osteotome and, and shaving some more bone away, it'll start bleeding normally and you can't, uh, you can't crush it very easily. But you have to, you can't stop until you get there. This is one where we actually were getting out almost close to the hip joint and uh, we were getting a little worried about that, but we got a real nice resolution of this in this, in this patient uh, for, his, uh, for his resection. So here's why I think you have to be aggressive at bone and here's why the bladders have to come. Of the 48 patients, we've got three who have been stabilized, and I'm going to use quotes, stabilized with surgery, without surgery. Of the 45 who underwent surgery, 44 required a cystectomy, and I had two early on where I had to go back and redo some bone debridement. That's where we learned that we had to be very, very aggressive about taking more bone out. These are two cases where early on, I think we were timid and we didn't get out to normal bone. I was able to reserve, uh, preserve the, uh, the bladder in only one patient. That's actually a very specific case. That's a patient who actually had a very strange fistula that developed after a robotic prostatectomy who had had a prior uh, radiation. And it, 
probably was a surgical fistula, a complication that resulted in bone. So it was a real, real outlier. Now, of these three people who we have not operated on, unfortunately, these are three men who are just too sick to undergo surgery right now. Uh, one of these men probably could tolerate it, but has adamantly told me he doesn't want any more surgery. And these three men we see very frequently, they're on chronic antibiotics, um, and basically all three have a super pubic tube in, and they are becoming problems. I just got a phone call from one of these men saying he's not able to tolerate the super pubic tube and is now starting to, be, to develop pain when walking. So once that happens, we're probably be, going to be forced into doing some sort of extirpative surgery because once that pain with walking sets in, you'll, you'll end up seeing these people degrade very rapidly and end up on walkers or even on stretchers. And many of these men we've met on a stretcher on IV narcotics in a nursing home because their pain has become so debilitating. And it's quite striking uh, how they respond to surgery. They do do quite well. So let's talk about what happens. Um, of those men we've operated on so far, our mean or average hospital stay is 10 days. Uh, we have the normal complications or prolonged hospital stays that you see in cystectomy patients, such as ileus and fluid collections. 92% um, of these men, uh, when we take their bone out, we do send them for bone cultures, do have positive isolates that we have cultured, and they're polymicrobial in half the cases. The major bacteria are Enterococcus, Pseudomonads, and recently we've recognized significant numbers of these guys have fungus in there as well. So strange bacteria, right? Enterococcus. If I quizzed everybody and said, what do you think the bone infection is coming from? I think most urologists would say E. coli or you know, urinary type bacteria, but we're seeing Enterococcus and Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas doesn't surprise me, but Enterococcus is weird. So I, don't, I can't explain that yet. And then the fungus is pretty explainable because of the, uh, the antibiotics that many of these men have been on for many, many months uh, prior to getting to extirpative surgery. So that helps direct us towards what type of antibiotics we can use in order to calm somebody down when we first diagnose them. And it really relies on the carbon, carbapenems and glyco glycopeptides because that's what's gonna get your intercoccus. And we've recently added antifungals to our preoperative management. What I'm talking about is when a person presents to your clinic, they're super sick, you need to calm them down for a little bit and then prepare them for surgery. These are the antibiotics that you'll wanna use on this. We were fortunate enough to just get this article accepted for publication, looking at you know, the flora of what's growing out of these. And here you can see Candida is at the top. 22% of these men uh, grow out Candida, 20% um, of them have Enterococcus and then Pseudomonas. And then the majority are multi-organisms. So they'll have Candida, Enterococcus and Pseudomonas. And then you'll have these rare things down here. But basically every single one of our cultures from bone has grown out a bacteria that is consistent with a bacteria that would cause this problem. That's very interesting because remember, osteomyelitis classically is gram-positive bacteria such as staph and those type of skin bugs in the ortho literature. Here we're seeing gram-positive again, Enterococcus, but we're also seeing um, uh, uh, chloroph uh, you know, um, gut bacteria uh, rather than skin and that kind of stuff. And that makes sense. But again, I can't tell you why it's not E. coli and those types of things that you normally would see in the urine. So I think there are a lot of orthopedic complications in prostate cancer survivors. They're actually infrequently reported. The classic ones that we're taught about when we're doing our residency or our fellowship about what happens after a radical prostatectomy is this osteitis pubis. That's the non-infected inflammatory component of the lining of the bone. That goes away with anti-inflammatories. Um, you can get some men who get these stress fractures and insufficiency that, and osteonecrosis. That's mainly from radiation. So the key question I always get asked is, how do we know this is infectious osteomyelitis and not just osteonecrosis? Because they can look the same and osteonecrosis comes about after radiation therapy as well. Well, I think that the cultures pretty much prove this. And we have another paper that's just submitted and being reviewed right now where we've looked at the histopathology of all of our bones as well. And the histopath is very clinically uh, relevant for osteomyelitis uh, with the stains and the things that they're seeing, such as chronic and uh, acute inflammation, along with, um, with uh, the classic uh, findings for osteomyelitis. But I think the culture results really put the nail in this coffin. This is important because there's some people who argue that there is no active infection, and that's why you don't sometimes have to take the bone out 
you only take the bladder out. I'm gonna tell you, I've done two bone resections now where the bladder was taken out at another facility. They knew there was a fistula, but they chose not to take the bone out and the patient continued to have pain and resultant osteomyelitis. So they got sent to us for us to take the bone out later after the cystectomy. So again, good evidence that you have to take the bone and the bladder out. I have yet to see very many bladders that I can salvage after somebody has gone through this uh, and salvage appropriately, meaning get them continence, get them healed correctly and have good bladder capacity. Osteomyelitis itself up to now has been very uncommonly reported. Less than 1% of all osteomyelitis are reported in our world, uh, but they're reported after hernia, childbirth, trauma, and here you can see bladder neck suspensions. That's probably osteitis pubis. And then there's some case reports in the 50s of uh, osteomyelitis after prostatectomy, but this is not in the radiated population. So we didn't really talk about this up to 10 years ago. So I always had these questions what the heck happened to these patients? Because you know this has been happening for many, many years. I have a feeling that this was probably heretofore unrecognized. I think that these were men who were undertreated or mistreated and that this was a curable problem all along. And I'm gonna show you some of that. What I mean by undertreated is I honestly think that many of these men were diagnosed with recurrent prostatitis, recurrent UTIs. They ended up in nursing homes and then the story was that, you know, dad or grandpa died of a UTI or he just got sick one day and he melted away. This is a very indolent infection and disease process that moves slowly. So patients don't even know, nor do their family, how sick they're becoming. And it's just a natural process. And it seems like a natural slow uh, process of, of uh, fading away. So I think that this is unrecognized up to now, undertreated, and uh, it's potentially curable. So here's a little bit of anatomy lesson on why these guys get this pain walking. When you understand this, it makes perfect sense. This is out of an old uh, textbook. Um, you can see this is the pubic bone right here. These are your anterior leg muscles, the adductor longus, and this is your rectus. And they all insert right there, see that? So the idea is the uh, adductor longus adducts the thigh and also flexes it. Um, of course, your rectus help you do a sit up. So the classic thing these men will tell you is the first symptom I had was it was hard for me to get out of bed. And it's hard for me to get out of bed because not only do they do a sit up and use a rectus, but they have to flex their thigh in order to get out of bed as well. And you'll hear a story where I started rolling out of bed or I started not sitting in bed. I, I slept in a, in, a, in a recliner. Another a nice picture out of an old textbook. This is your pubic symphysis. This actually is your pectineus and that flexes your thigh as well and internally rotates it. And this is your obturator externus, which also adducts your thigh. So what you're gonna have is the men will tell you, I can't move my legs internal and I can't flex them. And it makes perfect sense why they get that pain because look at this, that's where it inserts, right on that pubic symphysis. So if that's infected, these tendons are infected, they get a wicked tendonitis and they can't walk. And what you'll see on the MRI is the most radiologists will read that there is inflammation and tendonitis and edema in that area, and they might miss that fistula because they're all trained to look for edema and stuff like that because MRIs are used so much in ortho uh, for injuries and those types of things. So when you see that edema, think osteomyelitis as well. So the first report actually came out in 2012 out of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. This is Jaspreet's group. Um, and they had a series of patients that they described the fistula, but they hadn't really described any osteomyelitis yet. Shubham and I were fortunate enough to get our uh, original series into uh, the literature in 2015, right after his fellowship, where we reported our first 10 men who had fistula that then developed osteomyelitis. Um, and then one of the reviewers of our article then published his series uh, about four months later that had a couple extra patients in it validating this. So the first three reports, and now we're having several reports out of this. What I wanna say is that the, the common theme in all of these reports, this is from New York City, this reports from us in Durham, North Carolina, and this reports from London, England. So transcontinental reports, the common theme is wicked pain, pain with walking, um, prolonged hospitalizations, prior history of radiation, and resolution of pain after extirpative surgery. So let me show you a little bit of data on that. 
So once again, the common thing was immediate and complete resolution of pain once you take the bladder and the bone out. And that led us to look at our uh, series here as well, um, where we looked at pain scores pre and post surgery. So this is a box and whisker diagram that we uh, developed. This is the pain score um, at the diagnosis when we first saw these patients and their average pain score, median pain score, that's, that's a box and whisker, that's the median line there, was a five and a half. And these patients, 50% uh, of these patients were on chronic narcotics for this. At their preoperative visit, we hadn't changed their pain score. The reason I show you these two is when we met them, then we put them in our pathway where they got hyperbaric oxygen therapy, antibiotics and the rest, and we didn't change their pain at all, despite six weeks of calming them down. But look, at their first follow-up, this is one month after surgery, their pain score goes down to a median of zero. Now we do have a couple guys who had a little bit of pain left, but then when we hit long-term follow them up, and these are all of our patients uh, in this cohort, nine months follow-up on the median follow-up there, a zero pain score. So very uh, significant changes from when we met them to when, uh, when we follow them up at nine months. Bottom line is this is a curable disease. It's a very large operation, but we can get these men's uh, quality of life back and their pain goes to zero. So it works. I think that that's, a, that's really striking because I don't think we have many surgeries where we can say we can cure your pain almost with 100% chance, right? Think about that. You know, you think of the old adage, if you operate for pain, you get pain. This is totally different. These, these men come back and, and actually feel quite good. So finishing up, I think uh, overall, we have to have a very high index of suspicion for this uh, disorder and we're getting better at it. Uh, I get a call about once a week. I think I have a man who fits everything you told us about in that talk. What do I do? And then they get the MRI, they send me the MRI, I look at it for them. I say, yeah, it looks like we have it. Here's what we'll do and we'll take care of it for you. MRI is the most sensitive way to diagnose this. Many are missed on CT and plain film, so don't get uh, pulled aside on that. But of course, if you can't get an MRI, the CT might luckily pick it up. The initial treatment is to calm them down with four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. We get urine cultures on them. We used to get a urine culture pre-op and a bone culture, meaning a bone biopsy pre-op, but we did a correlation analysis and we found out that the urine almost always matches what's in the bone in the pre-op evaluation. So now we get a urine culture. We make sure that it's an enterococcus and a pseudomonas, and we treat them for six weeks with IV antibiotics and fungals to calm everything down. I get them in hyperbaric oxygen therapy to help their post-operative healing because it's not gonna cure anything, but I do think it helps their post-operative response. And then at six weeks, we stop their antibiotics for two to three weeks, and then we do their surgery. That's very important. We try to stop their antibiotics in all cases for at least two weeks prior to surgery so that we get a good, uh, accurate bone culture when we do their extir extirpative surgery. And I think that that's why some groups argue that the uh, bone is, is sterile because they've sent cultures and it's uh, negative. But if you ask them, they've kept people on antibiotics right up to surgery. If you get them off antibiotics, you'll have 100% bone culture rate like, uh, like we're showing and like what we just published. So again, if you've got a man who comes to you who has pelvic pain and recurrent infections and you're diagnosing them as prostatitis and they've got a history of prior radiation therapy, think in your mind osteomyelitis. Again, you might diagnose it on a plain film. You can get that while you're waiting for the MRI. You can see this patient here has all this moth-eaten stuff in the pubic bone, but that's very uncommon. The real diagnostic criteria is the MRI. The MRI, again, if they have a history of radiation therapy, pain with walking, and you push on their pubic bone and they say, ouch, the pretest probability of that MRI is 100% that they're gonna have this disorder. It's curable. It's a very large operation, but we can get them through it. These men do very, very well postoperatively, and they're very, very thankful uh, for it. So harmless procedures can have disastrous consequences. What I'm talking about here is the radiated therapy guy who has, a, who has a stricture that you have to TUR, and you have to do that. I'm not saying don't do that, but just keep in mind that we can start these processes by those minimal procedures. Pain is debilitating, and that's the reason really to undergo this operation. They will waste away with infection, but you can stabilize the infection, but it's the pain that I think gets these guys into trouble because they are on stretchers and they don't ambulate, and the excision really provides excellent symptomatic results. This is a patient Shubham helped me operate on. I actually have a disclosure so I can use this video. 
This was a man that I met in a stretcher in a nursing home on chronic IV uh, antibiotics and narcotics. And this is him uh, seven, I think about six months after surgery and he's back to playing hockey with his grandkids. He's 83 years old. So this is the type of thing we can do for our patients. But notice he's not really playing hockey. He's just sort of skating in circles, but he's on skates. So that's the important thing. I do have to thank a whole bunch of people. Shubham helped me design this protocol and write the first article and, and cobble together this team. So I owe him a real debt of gratitude for this. Ted Hendershot is an orthopedic infectious disease doctor that has really helped us design these uh, treatment algorithms. And then the two orthopedic surgeons I've worked with, Bob Zur is now the chairman at LSU and Will Eward is uh, an orthopedic uh, cancer doctor here at Duke that helps me do these operations now. They've been instrumental in helping this. And then of course, all the fellows have helped us. I couldn't do this type of work if I wasn't in a place like Duke where we had basically a specialist in everything. So I really owe these people um, a debt of gratitude for helping me do these operations. And then just a little shout out, you know, if you ever think uh, you're having a bad day, um, for the last two months, this has been my wife. She's a primary care doctor in the Duke system and she's been shoving nasal swabs into mouths uh, in a tent for the last two months. So um, remember that it's, it can always get worse no matter how bad you think you have it. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Gupta and his team. And I really appreciate the uh, chance to give you a talk today on osteomyelitis. Drew, that was great. Thank you so much for a comprehensive review of, of this syndrome that you essentially have, you essentially discovered and codified over the last 10 years or so. Um, we are having quite a few questions come in. And again, we'll invite all the participants who have questions to put it in the QA and box. Uh, and we'll, we'll try and uh, get them as they come along. Uh, Drew, can you comment a little bit on, on pelvic instability uh, after that amount of bone resection? And is there, what is your follow-up so far? What is your experience and what yeah, is the basis thanks. for that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's one that we get very, very frequently. In fact, when we first started doing these operations, that was our concern. We're going to take all this bone out and we're going to destabilize the pelvis. Well, the orthopedic surgeons who do, uh, you know, sarcomas and stuff, they do this all the time for cancer. And it was funny when we first had this discussion, Bob Zura, who helped me design the operation originally said, ah, we'll follow them. If they get some instability, they'll get it in their sacroiliac joint. We'll just put a screw in it, he says. And I said, okay, that's fine. We've been following these men with SF12s and gait questionnaires now uh, throughout their recovery. We found not a single patient with a gait change, pelvic instability, or sacroiliac uh, arthritis at this point. And our median follow-up, you know, we're pushing six years on the median follow-up for these guys. You know, that's pretty skewed uh, because I do a couple tomorrow and I do, I've done them 10 years ago. But the bottom line is we have not had any gait changes. And the SF12s are pretty remarkable. And SF12 is basically a quality of life, getting back to your normal daily activities. And we found that the SF12 is almost normalized in these guys. And we, we've got that um, analysis going into publication right now. We're trying to fill in some gaps in that data. So we are following these men for that, and we have not seen any problems with instability. Besides the, the concerns with gait, uh, with gait, any issues with uh, removing that amount of bone where all these muscles insert? I know there's some, uh, there's some talk in the literature about hernias and such in these patients. Yeah, yeah, that's another great question. Um, we had, I had a series of pretty difficult to fix hernias uh, early on. Um, and the problem is if you've got bone that comes together and fascia that hooks on top of it, and if you just pull the fascia off and cut it off the bone, you're going to have a gap there that's like this, there, where there's nothing to hook anything to. So the, if you get a hernia, it's very, very difficult to fix. Uh, one of my first patients, we did that type of um, uh, exposure, and he developed a really bad hernia. In fact, we developed a, uh, a, a, a a 3D printed model of his pubic symphysis and we built one out of titanium and put that in there in order to fix his hernia and he had two recurrences after that. Since then I've uh, subsequently changed how I take the fascia off the bone. What I do is if the bones here and the fascia is on top of the bone it's hard to draw. I've tried to figure out how to draw this out so I could put it in the lecture. I have to show you in the, in the OR. But what you do is I roll the fascia off of the bone if the bone's behind it. I roll it off of the bone and I leave the fascia connected in the midline now. 
rather than just coming all the way down the bone and cutting it off the bone. It's hard to explain. I wish I had pictures of it, but we've, we've changed the way we open now in order to minimize our hernia rate. Um, since doing that, our hernia rates are very, very low. We've got one guy with a hernia now, but before that, uh, a lot of them had hernias and I was like filling the hole with uh, VRAMs and all sorts of stuff. And I haven't had to do that since then, but it is a concern on, on that. And it's, I, I just haven't figured out how to describe how I've changed that opening. I'll probably have to do a video of it uh, and send it to somebody smart like you who can help me describe it. Uh, that's great points. Um, Drew, I, I know you make an argument that uh, this thing has been going around for years and decades before we even recognize it. But, uh, uh, but do you really think that's the case? So it's more of a, you know, we're just biased because you're just seeing so many of these. Maybe everyone is sending you these patients. And is it the same across the board? Maybe radiation is worse now than it was earlier. Yeah, so we've looked at that, actually. I, I've, I've, um, um, uh, my, my thesis article was looking at dosages of radiation, how it's changed over the year to, to try and explain um, uh, the side effects we're seeing right now. There really has not been a huge change in the overall dosage. We've gone, we've gone down in brachytherapy use, we've gone up in external beam therapy use, and we've modified some ways to deliver external beam therapy with IMRTs and 3D conformal therapy and that kind of stuff. If you actually do subgroup analysis using HCUP data, Healthcare Utilization Project, um, national data, and you, sub, and you subgroup into IMRT and all the rest, you find no differences in these uh, admissions 10 years down the road. That's a very superficial analysis that I did for my thesis article for my thesis paper for my master's degree. But I don't think that the radiation is a culprit. I think the culprit is a survivor bias, meaning that these men that used to die in eight, nine, 10 years are now alive longer because we have all these great therapies for prostate cancer, you know, all this kind of stuff that I can't even pronounce. But the cancer doctors have gotten so good at keeping them alive that they're living longer. And so now we're seeing these down the road at 10 and 15 years. And I think that's really the, the, the issue. Um, I'm sure there's a referral and selection bias with respect to what we're seeing at Duke because they're coming from all over. Uh, but I am getting, I do get a lot of phone calls Every time I give a talk like this at a section meeting, I'll watch the audience and I'll see two or three urologists nodding their head. And then I'll get a call from them a week later saying, I got the MRI on my guy and it's positive. Can I send them to you? So that happens actually more often than not. Um, I can't give you a denominator on this, but I can see it's something that we're recognizing more and more frequently. And I think it's a recognition issue. I don't think it's a treatment problem. That's my gut feeling. Got it. Um, how about the type of diversion? Does the amount of radiation slash osteomyelitis bone damage preclude any continent diversion in these patients or are they still are candidates for that? Yeah, a another question we get asked quite frequently from referring urologists and the patients because the patients read about cystectomy and they, they always ask, can I have an orthotopic? The answer is orthotopic is totally out. The, the outlet is completely blasted. They're gonna be totally incontinent. Um, they're usually incontinent to start with. That's why I've uh, gotten to see them a, a quite a bit. Um, the idea is you cannot, there's nothing to hook up to down there anymore. And you'd have to do these operations, see it. It's all fixed. There's no outlet uh, to take care of. And usually there's a necrotic prostate bed that you can't remove safely either. And we just leave that in place. Um, I will offer right colon pouches uh, to men because usually the, the radiation that they're getting for prostate will not involve that terminal ileum and that, that cecum. It's very rare, but you could get that. But the targeting is so good now that they're able to keep that out of the plane. Uh, so I will offer that. I'll be very honest. The majority of uh, men that come to us with this choose ilia loops now um, rather than a our right colon pouch. And we do offer both. But the majority of men are choosing a, a loop. Maybe it's the way I counsel. Got it. Two major imports that I understood from this talk um, were that A, you have to resect the bone because it is infected, just diversion won't work. So it is not about just taking the inciting event away. Some bad things have already happened and you do have to resect the bone. And you do have to assume that there is a fistula, uh, there is an associated osteomyelitis or there's quote, um, uh, uh, and so, so it has to be resected and it's not a medical disease. And the second thing you stress is reconstruction is not really an option in most patients. And so you have to take the bladder out and the bone out, and you're not really fixing the fistula and doing any reconstruction. But 
we know from literature there are there are many uh, groups that have uh, published their experience with doing reconstruction. Mm -hmm. I know Dr. Stella Ivers is here. She is from uh, she's from England, and and uh, quite a few uh, of of our panelists have previously at least have some anecdotal experience with doing reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that disparity is? Why do you think that in your series everyone gets a diversion, and in some other series pe people get reconstructed? Yeah, so there is an option. Um, there are people who talk about a reconstruction where when you take the bone out, you augment the bladder and then come back later and put an AUS on somebody. Uh, I'm just waiting to see long-term follow-up what happens to those men uh, with that. Uh, the, my experience though is that these men are so debilitated by the time they get to this and you tell them, look, I can do something where you might need a series of uh, procedures after this, like an AUS and this and that and some revision surgeries. And the majority of them say, I, I just need this fixed and they want one operation with it. Uh, my clinical experience is by doing this, once we open the bladder, uh, the common finding is I find a contracted small bladder with radiation damage to the entire bladder. Uh, and then by the time you take the bone out, you've taken most of the anterior wall of the bladder. And then of course that anterior portion of the prostate. And then you're left with a prostate necrotic capsule uh, from radiation therapy. So for me to be able to patch on top of that, it's just outside of my skill set, and I've not been comfortable with being able to do an accurate reconstruction with that type of scenario, knowing that later on I'm going to have to come back and take care of the continents and all this other kind of stuff. So it's, it's a, there is a big part of clinical decision making that maybe I'm biased towards doing the extirpative surgery and the diversion. Um, you know, but if I see articles come out of a series of 20 people who got an augment in an AUS and, and I see them down the road doing well, um, I may consider that as an option. But I just, in my heart of hearts, I just, seeing these types of intraoperative examinations, I cannot fathom how I can, how I can repair those. Understood. Um, I, I know some of the studies, and I'm not going to belabor this uh, too much, but some of the reports and studies have been in in patients who've had, for instance, just a PVP, you know, without any his history of radiation, mm -hmm. just a, mm -hmm. just a, so I wonder in, in someone like that, it was just an outlet procedure mm -hmm. to begin with, whether, whether you can just do a salvage prostatectomy and, and yeah. repair and so on and so forth. But moving on, there's quite a few questions about yeah, let, the let limit. Me enter, look, can I, just real quickly, there is a difference if you diagnose a pubic symphysis fistula early, and they have not developed osteomyelitis yet, it's very possible you can fix the fistula, reserve everything, and get them through that. And that's that one patient we had where I think he had a surgical fistula after the robot that I told you about. We fixed the fistula and preserved the bladder in that case. But that's a guy we caught super early, like six weeks post-op from his route. The residents recognized it and, and diagnosed it, and I got that guy early. What I don't think can be fixed is the fistula that's been in place for a long time and now they've got osteomyelitis and the bone is infected. That's where you get into issues where you gotta get the bone out and usually the bladder comes with you on that one. So two different things. So the PVP in the place of a non-radiated field is a whole different disease process. So if you've got a PVP or HIFU or something like that where you've done this, it's very possible you might be able to fix that fistula. But in the guy who's had radiation 10 years ago, I really don't think that those are gonna be salvageable. Understood. We have a few questions about the limits of bone resection. How do you, how, how far do you go? Uh, and uh, are you not worried about getting to vessels in the obturator area? There's, there's some vessels with scary names over there. And, yeah. and what, and also intraoperatively, can you comment? Um, do, do you see a lot of blood loss from yeah. the bone resection part? Yeah, that's interesting. It, you know, this is a totally different operation uh, than a cancer cystectomy, to be quite honest with you. Um, it took me several years to make sure, you know, to convince our anesthesia guys that we don't need a big central line and all this other kind of stuff. Our average blood loss in these operations is about 300 cc's. Uh, we've looked at that as well. And we don't get a lot of blood loss when we're doing the bone resection because it's all necrotic bone. And what you do is you resect the necrotic bone that basically comes out like cheese and then you use the osteotome and the mallet to chisel some bone away until you see some nice bleeding. And then you can convert to this thing called a TPS. It's like a Dremel tool and accurately take some of that bone out of there. And once you get bone that's nice and oozing blood and that isn't squishy, 
that's the good bone. And once you make it all look like that, that's where you stop. But you go until you get that. And I showed you that picture where we went out almost onto the hip on that one patient. But it's quite striking when you meet that line. It's almost a single line. You'll go from necrotic to nice looking bone and then nice bleeding bone. And that's where you stop. That's where the orthopedic surgeon helps us. He's, you know, he's the expert. He'll say, that's good bone. We can stop now. Um, I saw a, a thing pop up that said, how do we know this isn't just osteonecrosis that's superimposed with infection? Well, I've got the infectious uh, disease or I've got the microbiology already reported. We've got a paper in for review now looking at histopathology and the histopathology is classic for osteomyelitis in these patients, not osteonecrosis and uh, not osteitis pubis. So we wanted to verify that this was osteomyelitis and we're convincing ourselves that that's, that's the correct diagnosis. Got it. And then uh, is there any role for prophylactic mesh placement for these patients? Like some biological mesh or something yeah. like that? Is that? Yeah, we, we've looked into that. Uh, the way we've changed how we open now, we have not needed that type of prophylactic thing. But early on when I was opening and ripping all that fascia off the bone and leaving a gap like this, we were putting VRAMs down there and all sorts of things from the thigh to try and prevent hernias. But now that we've modified how we open, we found that we don't need those types of things. So we have not uh, needed, we have not seen that as a requirement at, at this point. Got it. Um, what about um, any therapy for bone health? Does that have a role? Have you explored it? Like, you know, bisphosphonates and yeah. uh, Xgeva and denosum nomad or something like that. I don't know what it's called. Really. Stuff I can't pronounce either. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a really interesting question. Quite honestly, I appreciate that because that's the very first time that that's been brought up and I haven't even thought about that yet. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, we should look at vitamin D and calcium supplementation because remember the current guidelines for uh, ADT therapy is put men on calcium and vitamin D supplements. And we haven't even thought about bone health in these guys. Um, it's something we have not explored yet. So I'm adding that to my list to look at. Thank you for the question. That's perfect. That, that's a, that's yeah. insightful. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's one of our senior residents who is really yeah, I need to look interested into that. in oncology. Yeah. If they want to do a project, have them call me. Yeah. Um, I know uh, Dr. Ivers is here. Uh, I, I don't know whether she has a microphone enabled and she's in the panel, whether she'd like to make any comments uh, or observations about this talk. Uh, I really very much enjoyed it. I don't know if you can hear me, but that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I really uh, appreciate your microbiological results. Do you also have a histopathologist look at them and what did they think? Um, does it match up with the osteomyelitis picture? Are they all happy and in agreement with each other? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, the way that went down is quite interesting. We were really interested in the bone culture data and we submitted that paper and wrote it and the reviewers, several reviewers said, well, uh, what, you know, it got accepted for publication, but some of the critiques were, tell us about the histopathology. Well, we answered all the questions, but we didn't have room for that paper to add the histopath findings. So we have a second paper now in submission and in a review process, looking at the histopathology findings. And the histopathology is done by a bone pathologist here at Duke who helped us co-rate that paper. And they are all consistent with chronic osteomyelitis. Actually, they've got components of acute and chronic in all of those samples. So again, it's not osteonecrosis that got super infected. This is, this is osteomyelitis. And, and we've looked at that. And I never even thought about that there was a question about it until we had a couple arguments in, in certain sessions. So it forced me to look at that objectively, and, and uh, I'm convinced that this is infectious osteomyelitis at this point. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for great talk. Thanks, Drew. So take-home points. A man comes in with a previous history of uh, prostate cancer, some kind of ablative energy treatment as a primary or as an adjuvant treatment, and an outlet procedure with pubic pain. Think of osteomyelitis. And then get an take MRI. The get an MRI. Get an MRI. Yep. Uh, any other comments from our panelists? All right. I, think I have a couple will... of questions. I'm sorry. Just uh, yeah. more like a recipe. Uh, if you can give us a recipe after the procedure, do patients continue uh, with the prolonged antibiotic treatment? Uh, do you treat them per culture that you discover? 
And yeah. uh, do you continue uh, hyperbaric oxygen postoperatively to, to help them heal more? Yeah, I get the I get the HBO pre-op, uh, and in the United States we can get that paid for with the fistula diagnosis. And I am convinced that the pre-op HBO helps prevent some of the problems that we were seeing post-op, wound infections, healing rates, that kind of thing. Because I actually stopped the HBO for a while when we decided it was a surgical um, disease. Because remember, I started HBO thinking I could cure it. When we realized we couldn't cure it without surgery, I stopped putting people through HBO. And I saw an uptick in my surgical site infections and wound problems. And I started the HBO again, and I've seen a downtick. I can't prove that, but that is a clinical observation that we've had. So that's why I've changed that therapy. I do not do HBO post-op any longer uh, for these men. Post-op, they do get IV antibiotics for six weeks post-operatively to help continue to clear the infection. And they stay in hospital until the cultures come positive. And most of our cultures are coming positive within days for the bacteria. The fungus usually comes out later, but almost everybody's getting fungus. So the infectious disease guys help us care for these people post-op and they go home on culture specific driven IV antibiotic therapy uh, for six weeks. And then we take them off that and we follow them clinically after that. And we get ESRs and um, inflammatory markers on a serial basis. The other thing we need to write up is all their inflammatory markers are sky high before surgery, obviously. And they all normalize just like that pain score does when we see them follow up, like within a couple months, it's quite striking actually. So you can follow the inflammatory markers as well. Um, a lot of that post-op antibiotic therapy is really based on opinion and it's based on the ID guy, the ID team extrapolating data from other osteomyelitis experiences that we wanna clear that infection out. Very rarely we'll have an antibiotic that will cover it uh, orally um, and they'll go home on that. But the majority need IV antibiotics because they're usually multi-drug resistant forms of this because they've been pounded with antibiotics for months or years before they get to us. Hey, Drew, this is Ramona. I have a question for you. Uh, in the same line, do you see a role of physical therapy pre-op and then uh, as a rehabilitation, especially in those guys that you cannot get into surgery? Yeah, so you're, I think you're mentioning the whole prehab idea now. Um, prehab is very difficult to do with these patients because a lot of them can't walk. Some of them are stretcher or wheelchair bound. Uh, and we, we really haven't incorporated that into our pathway, but that's another really good idea is the role of prehab in these men. We do do a lot of nutrition evaluations uh, and we find that these guys are cachectic, their albumins are, are low, not the best marker of nutrition, we know that, but we do put them through a nutrition consult and get them on supplements prior to surgery because they're all malnourished because they're in a chronic catabolic state from this inflammatory component. But yeah, a codified prehab program is very, is very relevant and we have that now at Duke, so I, I, you're right, I should run them through that. One more uh, question. You mentioned that uh, prostatectomy with patients with necrotic prostate is not done or not completely done. Is it a partial uh, debridement and uh, partial cystectomy or total or radical cystectomy, partial prostatectomy? Can you describe what, what is the procedure? Yeah, it's a, uh, <laughs> Shivam knows this Term, we call it the Peterson no technique cystectomy. Literally the, the prostate and, and the bladder come out in piecemeal. This is not a cancer operation. You can't safely do it as a can't, you know, uh, keeping it all closed and pulling it out like that. And the, the majority of these prostates that we find if they've had the prostate not removed already is a necrotic cavity is really all it is. And so we scoop it out and we do the best we can to get that out of there. But since this is a quality of life operation, not a cancer life-saving operation, I, I choose not to put the rectum at risk in these cases uh, to do what, what the cancer people would do with a cystectomy, get behind it and all that kind of stuff. We, we literally take out the best amount we can and, and ablate the rest of it. Understood. Well, uh, this, was, uh, this was wonderful, Drew. Thank you so much for uh, taking time on this Saturday. I know you had better things to do, like go to Whole Foods and tennis, play okay. some tennis and things like that. So, well, I don't know how it is in Cleveland, but with us being shut down here, it's kind of like being deployed in the army. Every day is exactly the same. So this doesn't bother me. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's Groundhog Day. Yeah. yeah um, Groundhog Day. Thank you uh, to all the panelists. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, and uh, this has been a wonderful series so far.
uh, we will be putting out our our schedule for the coming weeks uh, soon. We don't have any lectures scheduled for next week, but we'll have a, a few more lectures coming out uh, later in the month or next month. Uh, we'll keep you all updated. We have all of your information and we'll send out emails about that. Thank you all.